Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sunbury Motors would love to sell 1,000 Fords this year. That's one of many great products they have there. Great sales staff. They deal with you personally. Awesome service department. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Key Routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. After Penn State disposed of Nebraska last night, Maryland played Iowa, and Iowa had another dramatic finish that this time did not go their way. Final 14 seconds. And it goes to Cowan. Bohannon's on him. Cowan will drive. Goes to the rim. Throws up a shot. It's no good. The tip by Bruno is good with seven seconds to go. And the Terps lead it 66 to 65. That is my man, Johnny Holiday. <laughs> you know what? Johnny is. Johnny's remarkable. And I think it'd be even more so if you know how old I mean Johnny's Johnny's of his late seventies now. He's he sounds better than ever. We're gonna try and get uh, Johnny on the show next week. He's because when he and I get together, it is my problem is I can't stop laughing. <laughs> he is one of the absolute great guys on the planet. <laughs> Although today Don Fisher at Indiana called me this afternoon. <laughs> And Fish and I were talking for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and, you know, they had a tough one last night. Purdue won, what, 40, what, 40, was, 8, 46 was the final? Yeah, or 46, like 45 or whatever, yeah. 46, 45. And I said, Don, I said, you do know. They said that you guys combined for fewer points than Penn State scored last <laughs> night. <laughs> Said, I thought Bo Ryan snuck into the gym or something as a uh, old, old, you know, circa uh, Wisconsin ball. It's like wow. He, he says, you know, he says, he says, Steve. He says, he says, I know you've had a few games like that in your lifetime. I said, yeah, you got to, you have to. I said, Don, you have to come up with eighteen different ways of saying no good. That way, you're not redundant. <laughs> All right, the Penguins. Uh, have played well of late. Uh, they beat Philadelphia. They beat uh, Connor McDavid in Edmonton. They lost to Calgary. Then they bounced right back with a 6-5 win over the Rangers and won last night 4-3 over the Devils. David Putty was there last night, Seinfeld fans, and took a header next to the uh, Devils bench. Steve Mears, the TV play-by-play voice of the Pen. Steve, great to have you with us. Hey, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. All right. All uh, right. Since Malkin has come back from the one-game suspension, he only had 18 goals before the suspension. and kind of felt like he was going along. What's been different for him? Well, I think you're starting to see him, for one thing, shooting the puck more. That's uh, one thing Mike Sullivan has been looking for from both him and Phil Kessel. And everything was going well. I, I forget what the uh, shot total was, something like 16 in three games and and uh, seven in the, the game over the weekend against the Rangers. So I think that's one of the best signs is that he's just shooting, getting those shots on goal. However, last night, zero shots on goal. So uh, it was kind of a regression from what we had seen. Uh, a poor game. It just wasn't uh, as dynamic as we saw on the weekend from him or Kessel. Neither of them had a shot last night. Uh, but the good thing is the Penguins got some scoring from different sources, and I thought they defended really well in the second period and ultimately uh, were able to hang on for a 4-3 victory uh, against the Devils team that's given them some trouble over the last couple of seasons. You can't lose four games to a last-place team and expect to make the playoffs in any given season. So uh, the Penguins were able to salvage something out of the season series, got the two points, which are necessary, and uh, really important here at this time of year with it being so tight in the Eastern Conference. And uh, I think there was a lot to like last night at Newark. Uh, back-to-back one-goal victories. Beat the Rangers 6-5, beat the Devils last night 4-3. Uh, 
you have to do certain things to make sure you secure wins like that. What was the common thread between the two that allowed them to get a pair of one-goal victories? Yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, offense here lately. That's that's the one thing. And that's never been the issue for the Penguins. Uh, you know, if you think back decades, this has been a team that's known to have skill and can score. And, uh, and here this year, we're seeing it. They're one of the best offensive teams in the league, very dynamic, led by Crosby and Malkin and company. Latang having a career year. Uh, so I think if you put up six on the board against the Rangers and you get another four last night, I think it's five of the last six games they've had four or more. Right. So the offense is there, uh, and the defense is coming along. I really like what I'm seeing defensively ever since Justin Schultz came back. Yeah, for those who don't know, missed 53 games due to a broken leg, missed four months, and he has come back, and the uh, return has just been seamless. I, I think he really deserves a lot of credit. And the fact that he's right-handed makes a big difference. So now on the Penguins' defensive pairs, on all three, you have that lefty-righty dynamic that you ideally would like to have. One left-handed D-man, one right-handed D-man, Schultz being the right-handed one uh, on a pair with Jack Johnson. And uh, I think it's working really well. It's an aspect that probably doesn't get talked about all that much. But now with Schultz and Chad Ruedel, who's right-handed, Uh, I think it helps out with the puck movement. And the the name of the game for the Penguins is get the puck up quickly and get it in the hands of those supremely talented forwards like Crosby, Malkin, and Kessel and company. And uh, they've been able to do that here these uh, last four or five games. I I like what I've seen, especially on the offensive side, and they're getting the finish too. Uh, Let's get to Matt Murray for a moment. Early in the season, you know, he, he struggled. And then he was out for a period of time. Then he came back. Now it seems of late he has found a groove out there. As you've observed him, Steve, what's allowed him to be a little bit better as time has gone? Yeah, I think it's uh, just his poise and his mental toughness. That's, that's the greatest strength for me. I, I'm such a fan of his mental approach for a guy who is only 24 yeah. and is still the seventh youngest goalie in the NHL. We forget about that. We think of him as this veteran because he's won two Stanley Cups and has had, had numerous playoffs victories and big game performances in the postseason but he's still incredibly young relatively speaking especially for that position so uh there's no doubt the lower body injury that you talked about there that was bothering him he missed a month decided to shut it down he tried to play through it didn't want to use it as an excuse but it was obviously something that was an issue so then he comes back and he rattles off this incredible winning streak and he looks like the matt murray of old he won 10 of 11 uh, last night, thought he was solid. Gave up the one last goal. It was a little leaky against Miles Wood. But um, overall, I, what is it, five losses in two months for Matt Murray. I, I really think he is back uh, after some struggles early on in the season. And for him, a lot of it is just about staying healthy. He's had these kind of nagging injuries that have plagued him throughout his career. He's also dealt with a couple of concussions, including one earlier this year. So for me, a lot of it has to do with health. And the good thing is uh, – when Matt Murray has gone down with some type of a, a bump or a bruise, Casey DeSmith has been able to step right in there, and he's yeah. been excellent uh, really all season long. So uh, the goaltending looking very good. I know Jim Rutherford Mike Sullivan have a lot of confidence in uh, the two guys that they have. I know in football sometimes Jack Ham and I will talk about uh, time of possession. It doesn't figure into every game, obviously, but we'll, you know if, it, if it's a factor. I've always felt the Penguins have been great in helping out their goaltenders because of puck possession. Have they been better with puck possession the last couple of weeks? That's been the name of the game in the NHL for for quite a while here. and It kind of goes back to what I was talking about with uh, that transition. You you want to defend really well, then be be in the offensive zone. Get it out of your end as quickly as possible, but maintain possession. And I think a big part of that these last few games has been having one left-handed defenseman, one right-handed defenseman, and also having Justin Schultz back. I mean, this guy is so underrated. And he could be on a top pair on a lot of teams in this league, but he's kind of overshadowed on a team with Chris Letang and Brian Dumoulin. He's not going to get a whole lot of number one power play time. And he misses four months, and that wasn't really talked about when the Penguins were struggling, how much they missed him. But he's one of the most underrated players on the roster. And now to have him back after a serious injury, and he looks fantastic, and he's chipping in with a few points here and there, and he's just a great puck mover. He's amazing at what he's able to do. He defends well. But then he gets it out of the zone quickly and is able to complete an accurate pass, get it up to those forwards, which is where you want the puck going. Get it going north and get it in the hands of Crosby and Malkin. Uh, No doubt that uh, he has made a huge difference. 
So uh, I think him, also Marcus Pedersen, was a trade acquisition earlier yeah. in the year. Uh, and that was talked about quite a bit because they gave up a good young player in Daniel Sprong. But Marcus Pedersen has put up just as many points yeah. as Daniel Sprong. He's a defenseman, and uh, I think he's defended really well. So uh, that was a nice pickup by Jim Rutherford. Young player, too. He's only 22 years of age, youngest defenseman that the Penguins have. And uh, that's been a really solid acquisition. They see him uh, with a real bright future. You know, the left-right thing is really important. And that goes back to the time, you know, when I started watching hockey in the 70s, for goodness sakes. But uh, you have to have the sink to work with somebody. Schultz is out 53 games. Have you been surprised at all with the ease with which he and Johnson fit together back there, despite the fact they have not worked together very often in their careers? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I think it's a testament to just their abilities and the fact that you're talking about two veterans there. Schultz has been in the league now a long time. He's a two-time Stanley Cup champion. We remember how good he was in 2017 when Chris Letang was out for the season and Schultz stepped up. He was unbelievable in the playoffs, had a career year, put up some big numbers. And Jack Johnson, uh, you know, there there are all these uh, advanced stats and The analytics community is all against Jack Johnson and everything, and I do think there is a place for those advanced stats in hockey, and the teams agree with that. There is a place for it, but it's this absolutist position that some of these analytics people have where they completely write off a guy as he's somehow irredeemable because he has some type of bad coursey or bad puck possession numbers. It's absolutely ridiculous. I think he's been solid. Jim Rutherford addressed this. There was an article today uh, and he talked about uh, not being too happy with uh, some of the criticism that Jack Johnson has faced. The guy leads the team in hits. He's top ten in the league in that category. It's definitely not easy. He's uh, second on the team in shot blocks. For the most part, he's defended pretty well. He's been a part of one of the best penalty kill units in the league, and a big part of that, Mike Sullivan always gives him credit for uh, his penalty killing game that he's brought this season. And he brings an element that the Penguins didn't have a whole lot of, a little bit of toughness, some grit, on the blue line you can't have just all puck movers so uh there might be some advanced stats that say jack johnson's really struggling there's certainly some merit to that i think it's a tool that can be used by these nhl yeah. teams but it is not yes. the end-all be-all and there will be exceptions as there are with every oh. rule so i think that's one thing that has to be kept in mind johnson's been really solid uh, that's what's always has, has struck me about analytics you feel about analytics the way i do uh, whether I'm doing football, basketball, or some baseball that I do. Analytics have a great use. They are a great tool to look at, but it's also a tool to look at. Observation is important as well. And sometimes you can look at somebody and say, okay, that doesn't fit what I'm seeing. And I sense that when it comes to him, that's a, that's a case where you're looking at him on an every game basis and it doesn't fit the narrative of what the numbers say. Of course, yes. You have to pass the eye test. Yes. Uh, it's been talked about quite a bit you know, with with so many different aspects of the game. And, uh, and there are going to be exceptions to every rule. I think you have yeah. the, the you have your toolbox, right? And you, you've got this as one tool. But it's that absolutist position that I can't stand. And you see it on Twitter all the time. <laughs> like this complete yes. write-off of a guy because one stat says that he's not proficient in a certain area, but he's bringing a lot of other things to the game. Right. So that's the part that annoys me. And then a lot of the other really beneficial things that that person or that program would uh, would bring to the table, it gets written off because of the, some of the ridiculous uh, viewpoints that they have. And the other thing in hockey, is you talk about some of the other sports, hockey is a very emotional game. It is not quite the same sure. as baseball and the one-on-one yeah. matchups and so forth. Extremely emotional game. I always go back to 2014. And uh, the Penguins played the New York Rangers, and and the Penguins had total control of the series. Yep. Marty St. Louis' mother, unfortunately, passed away midway right. through the series, and the Rangers rallied behind that. They yep. rallied around it. They ultimately came back from a 3-1 deficit. They won in seven games. And I always say, okay, tell me the advanced stat that explains the Rangers <laughs> right. before the sad passing of his mother and after with the way that they played. It's an emotional game. Yeah. And that was certainly an emotional situation. Mm-hmm. And uh, by their logic, that should have continued. Whatever they were doing after the fact should have continued, should have been there before. But it, right. obviously, uh, there were other factors at play there, and it was a big reason why the Rangers won that year. That's one thing I always go back to. But there are countless other uh, examples. Uh, it's an emotional sport, yeah. and uh, a lot of times it comes down to a bounce and maybe just some will. Steve, one final question. I'll let you go. I appreciate your time very much. Stadium Series is coming up. Uh 
How do you feel about those games, the atmosphere of it, and obviously the unpredictability of what the weather might be this weekend? Yeah, I've seen some of the uh, forecasts. <laughs> always interesting. It's always uh, one of the uh, main subplots of the whole narrative with uh, the weather. So, uh, you know, see some rain, that's not good because uh, obviously you'd rather have a little bit of snow. You'd like to have a nice overcast day or uh, just a cold night in this case. Um, but I'm sure there's a contingency plan, as there have been for all of these. The NHL, when you think about it, with the outdoor games, they've gotten unbelievably lucky. Oh, yes, they for, have. Yeah. yeah, for the number of games that have been played outdoors, and the number of them, a large majority, have been under perfect weather conditions. Yeah. Even the ones in California weren't too hot. Some of the ones in uh, snowy uh, Minnesota, I, I called one of the games in Minnesota. It was the perfect setting, overcast, just the right amount of snow. Yeah. And uh, in New York, the same thing at Yankee Stadium and uh, a bunch of other ones. So they've gotten really lucky. I hope that string of luck continues. And uh, it's going to be an awesome event. I, I can't wait for it because you have the rivalry. I think the best rivalry in hockey is going outdoor for a second time. They played at Heinz Field two years ago. So it's the first ever outdoor rematch. And uh, there's a little bit of animosity, if you remember, yeah. last week at Getty Malkin, the six-wing incident on Michael right. Roffel, and he was suspended one game. So that just adds a little more spice to an already uh, heated rivalry. And uh, you have the geography. You're going to have a huge crowd. I think it's going to be an unbelievable event. Can't wait for it. And uh, we'll see how the weather holds up. But I'm sure no matter uh, which way it goes, they have a contingency plan, and uh, the game will be played one way or another. Steve, you do great work. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I was so sad. I missed David Putty wiping out last night. I wanted to, <laughs> yeah. Did you mention it? I only saw him out of the corner of my eye. We were just coming out of break, so I haven't even seen it yet, but I will make sure that I check that out since I'm a big Seinfeld fan. And he was in full character. Face paint, that. chest, shirt, jersey off. He was going crazy. I saw that. Uh, yeah, and I'm a Seinfeld fan. We took whatever. I, I just saw that. I thought you got to be kidding me, <laughs> <laughs> Steve. Thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Sunbury Motors Ford is getting the year off to a fast start. In January, SMC was right on pace to hit their goal of selling 1,000 new Fords in 2019. In February, Sunbury Motors will shift into high gear during its President's Day sales event. Choose from four city blocks of new Fords with savings up to 16 grand. Back from over 60 new Ford F-150 4x4s priced as low as $29,934. Deals on new 2019 Ford Fiestas are in overdrive. SMC has them starting at just 12 dollars 20 and it gets 35 MPGs. Select from over 45 Ford Escapes, and they're slashed to an amazing price of 17820 SMC has an incredible deal on a 2018 Ford Fusion. Discount it down to 17770 Sunbury Motors' goal of 1,000 new Fords in 2019 will give all of Central PA the largest, largest discounts on new Fords in recent history. In February, SMC wants to put you into victory lane and become a member of their 1,000 Club of 2019. Sunbury Motors in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury. Great to have you with us, little Phil Collins. Bob Euner told me before he left for New Zealand that uh, he and Alice were going to go see Phil Collins down there. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, as far as I know, he and Alice are back from their three-week trip, so... Good. Yeah. Can't wait to catch up with them. Yes. Yeah, can't wait to catch up with them. Man, you know, maybe we, like Bob and Alice, you and I ought to go to dinner and try to think of anybody else we should bring. Right, maybe Roger wants to go. That's an even number. Yeah, Roger, Kyle, six, even Kyle. number. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence, bring Mark along. Mm-hmm. Um, Jamie. She'd love it. It'd be terrific. I'm trying to think, if there's anybody else? Oh, Catrillo. Okay. Sammy. Yep. Sammy. Yep. Okay, we're up to ten. Yeah. Yeah. Take over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody else? <laughs> I would have invited Coach Hort, but the other guy made him quit. <laughs> <laughs> We got to find out if, uh, when Hordy's going to be back from FLA. He's still down there. Will he be back in time to collect uh, his award? 
Uh, I would think so. Yeah, because that's first. I thought the PABs in Hershey were first Monday in May. First or second Monday in May is when they normally have that. Oh man, I was hoping for the second Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should tell them, yeah, this is two days before the Purdy. You really need to be out on the links practicing. That's right. Yeah. You hear? And he just walked in the street. He just turned the corner. You need to get a couple rounds in so your back doesn't go out this year. Okay, then do both. Get the adjustment in. Oh, you mean his back? I thought you were talking about his game. All right. Uh, so <laughs> Both, yes. <laughs> by, by, by the way. Mr. Ham's new weapons, as he told me on a voicemail this morning, are somewhere over Nebraska. They have been ordered. They are on their way. Love that he calls them weapons and not clubs. That's what we refer to them as, weapons. Okay? We play at a country club. We use weapons. <laughs> So he needs to have a series of back adjustments before he plays golf with us? Probably only one will do the trick for him. I just want him out at least practice, at least, at least get nine in or a full round in before before the tournament this year. His attitude about practice is the same as Allen Iverson. Practice? You're talking about practice. Just go down there, aim for the bridge, get it out of the way, then we're good for tournament day. How about we just skip that hole? For safety's sake. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Today's show brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. They want to sell a thousand fours this year. They will. They have a great staff, a great product. They do, I mean, everything is one-on-one with you. This isn't trying to push you toward anything. It's trying to get you into the right vehicle that fits you. Service department's awesome. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia Routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's War. We just want to take one quick moment. want to pass along our well wishes to our great friend Greg Wetzel. Uh, just uh, bouncing back. And uh, he'll be back in full go and full go mode pretty soon. But uh, we want to wish our best to our good friend. So wanted to do that. We hear that he should be good enough to get to wrestling nationals. He and uh, Justin Michaels are broadcast guys for the Lewisburg football games on 100.9 The Valley. They're going to do a little road trip to Pittsburgh for the wrestling championships right. next month. So, yes. Yes, Mr. Ham asked me about tickets for that yesterday. I said, oh, my goodness. I said, yesterday? I, <laughs> I Look, let, let me put it to you this way, okay? I, I dropped it by somebody yesterday, and the door might be open because it doesn't hurt to be him. This is true. Okay. This is true. Okay. This is doesn't a situation where, yes, yes, this is one yeah. of those, yes. All right. Yeah. Um, I also mentioned Kevin wanted to go. Kevin Her. How, how does one describe a blank stare on the air? All right. So, okay. <laughs> Penn State basketball won last night, 95-71 over Nebraska. 29 for Lamar Stevens, 21 for Rajir Bolton last night. Shot 56% from the field, 50% in threes last night. And they won with relative ease. Uh, let's bring in Nate Bauer, Blue White Illustrated. Nate, welcome. Great to have you with us. Uh, great to be here. What's going on? How are you? <laughs> oh, they point me toward whatever I talk. It's just, you know another another day, another storm. So, <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> that's, how, that's how it works. Uh, Dick and I, Dick Girardi and I, had been sensing that they were getting close to doing something like they did last night. What about you as you watched them? Did, were you surprised by what you saw last night, or did you think that they were getting close to doing something like that? So uh, two, two points. Um, the first is I was more concerned about Nebraska in the sense of I didn't know what to expect from Nebraska. Uh, Tim Miles is potentially hot seat territory. I think that's 
uh, safe to say. Right. And so, you know, traditionally, I mean, uh, you've seen this, I've seen this, um, you know, teams, teams that are in that position that come into the Bryce Jordan Center, uh, it, it kind of works twofold. One is they usually play pretty well, and two, Penn State usually doesn't play that well in in, right. in those types of games. Um, you know, against against uh, what I would call wounded teams. You know, Penn State has has no showed at times under those circumstances. So, you know, I didn't really know what to expect from Nebraska, but as soon as as soon as you saw Penn State kind of build up that that double digit lead within the first ten minutes of the game, um, you know, you, you kind of knew. I mean, Nebraska was. Uh, Nebraska defensively was just a sim. Um, Penn State was was really doing basically anything they wanted. And you know when you get guys that are actually hitting shots to go on top of that, it um, you know it creates the, the type of atmosphere that they had last night. What has it said about the the players themselves and also how they've been used that a couple of them seem to hit the wall in mid January? Usually yeah. February first is the mythical wall. Yep. and now have bounced back the way they have. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I a couple of things. I, I think that uh, it's you can't blame any of them, uh, freshmen on up, for for probably having experienced some discouragement. Sure, there at the beginning of January. I mean, it, you know, all of those games, Alabama, NC State. Um, you know, even out at DePaul, like th- those were games that Penn State had opportunities to win. And I think Penn State knew that any one of those would have been resume boosters. I mean, it just take yourself back to, to that point in the season. Resume was something that they were concerned about, that, that they wanted to have. And, and you know, the, the aspirations of the, the NCAA tournament were still very much on the table, given how strong the schedule was. So when you miss those chances and uh, Roger Bolton has as bad of a day as he does out at DePaul, sure. um, you know, it, it, it can wear on you. And so, uh, you know, combine that with the experience out at Michigan, you know, uh, I, I don't think that it's a stretch to say that, you know, they, they really no-showed against Wisconsin. They were just down in dumps. I mean, that you know, the way that that kind of transpired with, with Pat Chambers, um it, you know, it it led to uh, a negativity um, or downtroddenness. I think that that also helped. You know, basically make those guys um, hit that wall. So the fact that they were able to, as a team, stick stick through it. Um, you, you know, I mean, uh, to me, a lot of that credit has to go to, to Lamar Stevens because he's the one who's yeah. who's picking those guys up and and frankly. Steve, he's the one with the most on the line. Yeah. He's the one yeah. with the, the, you know, look, this kid wanted to change Penn State basketball. And so when you have the experience or the success of last year, you seem to parlay that into a great year this year. And it did not go the way that he planned for it early in the season. You know, and and it took a lot of guts and a lot of courage for him uh, to, to keep everybody on the same page. Not only that, but he's also, whenever he's interviewed, and I talked to Pat about this last night, that when he's interviewed, he has made sure that he's talked about what Pat has meant yep. to all of this. I mean, what? Yep. how much does that help when the star player that can be the focal point that can go south and just go out and get his has not? Yeah, no, I I, I think you make a great point. He, he has... Uh, it, it has not been lost on me that he has gone out of his way at times to, to praise Pat. Um, you know, yeah. to, to, to because here's the thing: is like these guys are all aware. They know what's being said. They know what's out there. Sure. And when you're on ten, you can't avoid it. Um, you know, and and even before on ten, on seven, on eight, you know, those things as they kept building and building and building. You know, Lamar, you know, kind of refused to to say, oh, well, you know, uh, forget it. Uh, you know, he, uh, players check out. Like, that can happen. <laughs> you know, guys, guys yeah, can just uh, say, uh, Believe me, I, I think we watched an example of it last night with all due respect. No doubt. Yep, no doubt. No doubt. And so uh, for, for Lamar to have the buy-in that he has and for – the entire program under like at some point, and I'm sure you noticed it. 
Pat went from being, uh, you know, dispirited, I would say. I, I don't know if that's the right word. I mean, obviously, he always brings a positivity to, to what he does. But there, you could see the way that things were wearing on him. And at some point, it just kind of flipped where it was like, look, this is the hand that has been dealt this season. And you can either take that hand and go home with it and just say, well, better, better luck next year, or right. you can try to make something out of it. You know? and, right. and I think that this idea of getting better and development, uh, you know, he, he latched onto that, and it really, really, really has paid dividends because now you're seeing it. You're seeing it in all of these guys uh, up, and, up and down the lineup, uh, for guys who, you know, you might not even have high expectations for, but Jamari Wheeler is a much better player today than he was last year at this time. Right. Uh, and, and and that is significant. He might not ever be, uh, you know, Steph Curry, open, open three-point shooting kind of stuff, but if he can – Get into the lane and distribute, and get the ball right. to open shooters. That's a that's a huge component to the board. Uh, there's the other part too is that the scoring part. Scoring in this league in the last two weeks has plummeted. Uh, you know, a good example. Like I said I just got off the phone with Don Fisher, and Don did a game last night with Purdue, with where Purdue and Indiana combined to get fewer points than Penn State scored last night. Uh, and even even Iowa and Maryland, I mean, Nate, I expected points in that game between yep. the, those two. Yep. Uh, and uh, But yet Penn State's the team that has scored over 70 in two of its last three games. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, they have steadily climbed from the absolute bottom of the conference. You know, look, there's an element here of the first seven games that they played – uh, could not have been harder, <laughs> right? Like, like the defensive teams right. that they were facing, that contributed. Uh, Penn State had had some problems scoring the ball, no doubt about it. But um, you know, it, who, who you're playing matters, and where you're playing them matters. It's tough to score 75 points at Nebraska. Right. You know, it's tough to score 70 at Michigan. You know, so I, I do think that they again, they stuck with it. They and and frankly that this weave um, that they're running now, you know, they're not. Mm-hmm. They're they're yes, they're getting the ball to Tyson, but it's cre- uh, it's creating ball movement. It's making defenses correct. move. Correct, correct. And so when you when you have that, they, I think they've tapped into something that works on top of the defense. You know, the uh, the, the three quarter court press. I mean, once they started going to that. It, it really has paid dividends, and I think that they've returned to that well over and over because they understand that that's how they're going to get their points. But you can set that up when you score. Absolutely. See, and, that, and see the, the, everything goes hand in hand here. I mean, if you're yep. going through a shooting slump, we'll, we'll go to the one two two. Well, you, you can't, okay? <laughs> like, yeah. Because you're, you're backpedaling. Yeah. Yeah, and, so, and you know, uh, sometimes that takes an open shot uh from beyond the arc, but also sometimes that just just takes getting a, a bucket close, you know, to the basket. Sure. Um, and and I think that I mean even Lamar's misses right now look like they're going down. Right. They look like they're going in. Um, you know, so so when you start to inspire some confidence, you start to get a little bit of that mojo going. I, I you know. I think there's a, a little bit of, of a rehash of, of what happened to this team last year. It's just a question of uh, whether or not it's too little too late. And obviously, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're very, very, very much on the outside looking in uh, for any type of postseason sure. appearance. But, right. but uh, you, you know, certainly any type of run in the Big Ten tournament isn't out of the question. Uh, I don't think there's a team in the Big Ten that's going to want to play these guys. And – um, you know, just in general, uh, you know, make the first goal to to work your way out of the first day of the Big Ten tournament, right? right. Get get the Thursday. Get the well, Thursday. Well, now they're going to face a team that is also in the exact same category. Yep. No one, one four in a row. What's interesting is that when I watch Illinois play now over their last five games, I feel like I, I'm looking at a group of believers. Yep. Brad Underwood has them believing yep. that not only can they play, but they can beat anybody like they did with Michigan State a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm, you know, uh, uh, you beat you beat Michigan State. Um, you know, that's that's a huge win, and I think that that has has helped kind of propel them uh, forward. But it's in a lot of ways they're similar to Penn State too in terms of how much they've found an identity defensively and how much that defensive um, that defensive performance is able to spark points for them. So uh, you, you know. Penn State, <laughs> the way that the schedule has played out this year, I don't think could have been any more challenging in the sense that the teams that they played at the beginning of the Big Ten schedule yeah. were at their best at that point. And now they're facing you know, what, what we would all call coming into the season the easier portion of the Big Ten schedule. And all these teams are playing pretty well, too. The bottom of the league is playing pretty well. So Illinois, Rutgers, these aren't gimme games in in any capacity. Right. And Penn State's going to have to bring it to uh, to especially on the road. Well, this, right. See, this is where we're tonight. Duke will play North Carolina. It is a marquee game in college basketball. But the ACC's biggest problem is the bottom of the league is not yep. very good. Conversely, yep. the bottom of the league in the Big Ten can beat the top of the league. Yep, on a given Absolutely. night. On a given night. Yep. Yeah, and and if you look at if you look at Ken Palm, um, you know the Big Ten and the ACC are kind of neck and neck in terms of the top eight teams. You know, are all right. 40, 40 and up. You know, some something like that. I don't have the stat in front of me right now. State's forty eight, by the way. <laughs> right. Right. Right, which is uh, my my uh, Blue and Illustrated intern Dave Eckert actually pointed out today that. Only once uh, in the past, I don't know, five years, ten years, has there been a team with a losing record in the top 50 uh, of Ken Palm at the end of the season. So, right. um, you know, certainly the, the table is set there for Penn State to, to you know, again, keep not, not only keep winning, but keep itself in its standing pretty high uh, in those in those metric ratings and then get people to understand, like, look, this is – this is the type of season that they had. You know, this was this right. was not a bad team. It was a decent team that that just had some some crummy luck, some some officiating, and uh, you know some of their some of their own making for sure uh, to to come out on the wrong end of some of these games. Uh, one final question that deals with Josh Reeves. He hit a thousand last night. Yeah. Um, and I made the comment after the game that I think now that might relax him. A little bit. I think defensively he's played terrifically. I, I felt like he has pressed offensively. I think now that he's hit that milestone, it, you might see a more relaxed guy out there. And I think it's going to make a big difference to him because I don't think he's letting the game come to him because he's trying to force everything so much. It, yeah, uh, it's just been, you know, this, uh, this, that's the story of his season is yeah. pressing. Um, you know, and I, <laughs> there's uh, it's it's hard to get people to understand sometimes that trying really hard can sometimes actually be to your own detriment. And Penn State, uh, in a lot of ways, it's not that Penn State basketball didn't care. You know, apathy is something that, you, again, like we saw last night with Nebraska, you, you see that sometimes with teams. That has never been the case with this team. In fact, it's the exact opposite, and a lot of it has contributed to their own problems. <laughs> you know, Josh, Josh's uh, urgency to be an agent of change that would help Penn State, you know, lift the program from where he came in as a freshman to, to where it is now and, and bump it over the top, I, I don't think there's any question that that played a role in well, in a lot of his struggles that he's had this I, season. I saw that in Jay Sean Tate last year with Ohio State. Yeah, yeah, and so these guys, you know, these guys, uh, it, it's never that they don't care or that they're just wild and out of control. It's that they care too much, and um, you know, for Josh, it's it's. It's been good to see for him over these last five games, whatever it's been, for him to at least settle into the type of defense where he's not sitting on the bench. That I mean, look, he, he's been on the bench with 2,000 the first half for right. uh, too many games uh, throughout the season, not just even, even the Big Ten. So for him to be able to, to key in on his defense, 
uh, allow that to open up some things offensively. Uh, you know, look, uh, is he is he going to be a spot up uh, three point shooter? Is that is that leap ever going to happen? And, and is it going to happen down the stretch here? I don't know, um, but certainly he has an opportunity to uh, you know to get some easy buckets. Jamari Wheeler has helped with that uh, to, to to get some decent assists. Um, and still be a, uh, a, a good contributor offensively where teams have to play them, you know, honestly. Well, honestly, we have to go to a break. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, Nate, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time very much. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. And we will take that break. Back with more in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK. All right, Duke, North Carolina coming up tonight. First time they've met this season. Usually they meet the Wednesday right after the Super Bowl, but you're seeing now more and more. Michigan and Michigan State will play twice in the final two weeks. Uh, Marquette's going to play Villanova twice in the final two weeks. Tennessee and Kentucky are playing twice in the last uh, three weeks. And Duke and North Carolina are going to play twice in the final two weeks. That'll be a big so, ratings grabber tonight. I mean, no NBA to deal with? Yeah. yeah. No NBA to deal with because uh, it's Wednesday night, and usually ESPN carries the NBA on Wednesday night. They put Duke, North Carolina in its place tonight. Yeah, it's probably coming off the All-Star break, too. I don't, I don't think anybody's playing in the NBA, are they? I think they're still in the All-Star break. They are, yes. Yeah, so they put Duke, North Carolina tonight. And it should be a big ratings grab. And yet, I still think Duke's going to win this game by 7 to 10 points. Uh, their talent is just, in some ways, overwhelming. If they just had Zion Williamson, it'd be fine. But Barrett, Trey Jones, who's a great defensive stopper. I think North Carolina is very good, but I don't think North Carolina is great. And I think Duke will win the game by 7 to 10 tonight. I can't believe that Jerry Kill referred to P.J. Fleck as a self-promoter. <laughs> really? P.J. Fleck's probably sitting in his office in Minnesota right now saying, Oh my goodness, they're catching on. <laughs> yep. Time to go out to the... Yachting store and buy another Nora. All right. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Mark Brennan's going to join us on the show tomorrow. And the King makes his first appearance in two weeks. You're listening to News Radio 1070 WKOK Sunbury. You can hear us anywhere in the world with the Sunbury Broadcasting Corporation app.